I'm David Blanquita on behalf of London School of Business and Finance. I'd like to welcome you to a discussion with the Right Honourable Tony Blair, Prime Minister of the UK from 97 to 2007. And as part of those 10 years, you, you had me in Cabinet for eight of them, and four of those were when I was responsible for education, which covered both employment skills and, of course, universities. And I want to just explore with you those heady days when we were talking about the knowledge-based economy and whether you think the same lessons apply today? I think the lessons for, for the importance of a knowledge-based economy are probably even more important today than they were back in those heady days. I, I mean, even then it was obvious that if you wanted to, to succeed as a country, you weren't going to be able to compete on the basis of low wages. I think today when you see not just the emerging economies of China and India, but places like Indonesia, uh, places with large populations who are working their way fast up the development ladder. Um, for countries like the UK, for all developed countries, education and a knowledge-based economy is central to prosperity. If you don't have that, you don't win. There's quite a lot of scepticism, though, still in the UK. You know, people saying, oh, well, graduates can't get jobs and all of this. We, we had that back then, didn't we? We had all of that then, including, you know, that, that um, it was all a kind of waste of money to invest in education and so on. But, but I, I think the more you look around the world, one of the advantages of leaving um, the, the position is that you're able to see the rest of the world and study it more closely and in greater detail. But I would say there is just a global phenomenon today, which is um, the need for those uh, educational, technological, technical skills um, that are the only way people are going to get on and do well. And a lot of those skills today are, are globally marketable, by the way. So that means that your education system also, if it's done properly, becomes a, a, a major part of your economy. It doesn't just service your economy, it's actually a major part of your economy. Well, London School of Business and Finance are doing traditional degrees, but they're also linking those with professional qualifications in accountancy, finance, in management. Do, do you think that's a helpful way of trying to link business with academia? Yes, I mean, I think, you know, that how you um, make sure that what you're educating people for has got some uh, realistic application in the world of work, that is absolutely essential, of course. But uh, the other thing is, this is a, a situation in which what you need to learn and how you need to learn it is changing so fast. Yeah. So I think uh, the way the London School of Business and Finance has gone about trying to position itself and do what it's trying to do is a great example of what can be done and should be done if you want your people to have the opportunity um, to, to undergo the personal developments that's necessary. I mean, you know, when you go back to when you and I were at school or university, even then people were starting to move beyond you know, you go into a job, you stay in that job for a long period of time, you basically, you know, you get your education when you're at university and that's that. Um, even then it was changing, but today, I mean, there's a revolution that's gone on in the world of work in these last 10 or 15 years, and we've got to keep up with it. Well, you remember two things from way back in the year 2000. One was that you sent me off to China uh, to, uh, to recruit and to get the message across that uh, UK, that good. UK higher education that. had a great deal to offer. Uh, and uh, we've been working on it ever since. And the second was the effort to, to use technology, to use the web as a, a learning tool. And LSBF have actually developed an open platform on Facebook for materials free. Uh, and they're also obviously using technology in quite imaginative ways to, to link traditional teaching with teaching online. And we were talking about it then, and, and they're doing it, but it, there's a long way to go on this, isn't there? There's a long way to go. Um, again, around the world, um, what is happening is that, one, people are using technology in far more imaginative ways, so distance learning and so on. And because the technology makes it possible, why not do it? Mm. Indeed, often what I say to a lot of the governments I've worked with in the developing world is, actually today with the technology and knowledge that we have, don't simply imitate our systems in the West, learn as to how you can in fact move ahead and get, a, get ahead of them because actually we still do things in a very standardized way because when we were constructing our systems the technology didn't exist. So this is a, you know, this is a paradigm change I would say in the way that education is conducted. And the second thing which is very important for countries like, like the UK is that your um, higher education 
capability should be a major export for you to the world. I mean, this is um, you know, absolutely clear that, that for many of the developing countries who need to develop fast, have got to develop fast, they need to import the academic and intellectual capital. And if we've got institutions that are able to, to provide that capital for them, it's, it's of enormous benefit and they will access it. And we've got a, I think, probably a, a window still to use the English language in the attraction of the historic quality of our higher education, haven't we? I think we've got to build on that rather think, rapidly. Yeah, we, we've got an enormous opportunity, English language for one, um, and the fact that actually so many students from abroad come here, because your visit to China, by the way, did you <laughs> benefits. I mean, the truth is, we're up there now um, with the best in the world at attracting students from all over the world to come and study here. And those people go back, not just having studied in the English language, but, but also with some tie to our country. One big issue I just would, would not be forgiven if I didn't explore with you is that on the back of the global meltdown, all sorts of changes happening in the world. And apart from your faith foundation, your pro bono work in the Middle East and Africa and elsewhere, you've obviously got tremendous experience in the business world globally. And I just wonder what the messages were from you in terms of how we come out of that global meltdown and how we give people confidence in the professions and particularly moving to advanced manufacturing as, as well as retaining what we can of our service sector. I think what is really important um, in the aftermath of the, the, the financial crisis is that we um, learn the right lessons from that, uh, which I think are all about how you understand and track the use of the new financial instruments today in what is an increasingly interconnected economy. But I think what's really important is that we don't as it were, discard some lessons that are very obvious and that survived the financial crisis. And one of those is that the world is more interdependent today, um, that you, if you want the most business opportunities, it is in many ways about connecting um, the ideas of the developed world with the emerging markets that, that, that are coming through. And in fact, all the way through the financial crisis have been growing strongly. And one great way of doing that is through the extension of links in, in the higher education. So, you know, I think, yes, there are, are serious lessons about the way we operate our financial system, um, but I still very much believe in an open economy. Um, I think it's important that we get the right partnerships between public and private sector. And I think the single biggest thing that's going on in the world today is the possibility of the right partnerships between developed and developing world. And many of those partnerships are going to result in not just improvements in the develop, developing world that need that, um, the management expertise often, the intellectual capital, um, quality investment from the developed world, but also in the developed world itself, where you know, we need new markets for our goods and where we need increasingly to move up the value added chain in areas like advanced manufacturing in order to succeed. And continuing reform in higher education? <clears throat> Absolutely, that should uh, carry on. Um, Public-private links, for instance, which uh, we were just beginning to move towards all those years ago. Well, if you look at the world today, the one thing that is absolutely clear is that there is a permanent revolution going on uh, of change. And this is very uh, discomforting for people at one level. It's also very exciting, by the way, yeah. at another level. Um, it offers enormous opportunity, but only for people who are prepared to constantly to reassess, to reevaluate, and to adjust. Um, and that is as true in higher education as it is if you're, you know, in the financial sector or in manufacturing. Uh, anyone who stays still gets left behind. And finally, uh, perhaps a, a message to students of the London School of Business and Finance. What, what would your message be for, for the future for them? Make the most of the contacts you're going to make uh, here because you, you'll, you'll form relationships and friendships and contacts that will be immensely important in later life. And, you know, I, I really do believe this is a world today that works by connectivity. Um, and those people that are well connected, and that's not just a matter of technology, it's also about forming the right partnerships and relationships. Those that are well connected will do well. Tony Blair, thank you very much indeed for sparing time to have the discussion and as ever, I wish you well. <laughs> Thanks, David. Thank you. My pleasure.